Good morning, everyone. We, uh, without any uh, further introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Philippe Coupiers from Brussels, and he will talk about EU experience in assembly cohorts of cohorts. So, European view. Thank you much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to the organizers. Um, I'm addressing to you this morning from a funder's perspective. And as you know, the European Commission is funding a quite large program for research and innovation. And that is called Horizon 2020 and spreading between 2013 and 2020. And um, in my talk today, I will explain to you which type of efforts that we are doing to support um, health research cohorts in Europe and in particular, which are the efforts that we are investing in supporting the integration of cohorts, so building cohorts of cohorts. Um, first, in terms of research priorities that we have within Horizon 2020, we have may, seven main research priorities which are mentioned here on this slide. And um, what you can see, of course, is that um, for those on personalized medicine, or on infectious disease or on environment and health, it's pretty clear that we need to have uh, a lot of research cohorts and support from cohorts in order to, for example, have a better patient stratification or population stratification. And um, this is one of the main reasons why we have invested quite a substantial amount of money in building cohorts or supporting existing cohorts. Actually, if you look at um, different framework programs that we have done since now about 10 years, we have started the effort to support cohorts in FP7, the framework program 7 mainly, and we have pursued that um, in Horizon 2020. In total, for more than 3 million people in Holt in those different cohorts, and for close to 1.5 billion euro invested, which is close to 1.5 billion dollar, invested in building those cohorts. Um, importantly, what I have to say is that um, we don't fund a lot of global population cohorts. We fund mainly disease cohorts. So that's something quite um, important to say here because I understand from this meeting that you focus mainly on the global population cohorts of more than 100,000 people, which is not frequently the case in what is funded here. So that being said, um, what we wanted to invest in terms of efforts recently, two years ago, um, is to build a better integration of those cohorts and to network them. So what we wanted to have is really to maximize the exploitation of the existing cohorts, to put them together and people can choose the way and the population that they wanted to focus on, either children or elderly or disease population. And of course, also we try to encourage them to mix as much as possible um, different types of data, including electronic health records, for example, or ge geographical data. And of course, all that, um, and that was even the primary question, needs to be sustained by some working hypothesis. And so again, people were free to formulate the one that they wanted. And of course, as mentioned yesterday, the reason to um, put efforts in integrating cohorts and building cohort of cohorts was, of course, a question of number. It was to have um, more solid scientific evidence uh, for risk factors of disease, for example. But numbers were not only the only solution why we wanted to build these efforts on integration of cohorts. And as you know, um, Europe is a bit special. It's a kind of very heterogeneous landscape. And this means it's heterogeneous in terms of genetic variants, but it's also very heterogeneous in terms of lifestyles or in terms of exposure to environmental factors. And that um, was also one of the reasons why we wanted to build on integration of cohorts, the, mon the numbers, and to take stock on the heterogeneity that is offered at the European level. So, and um, in the next slides, I will um, just here show um, eight examples of projects that we have been funding on integration of cohorts. And um, three of those, um, Atlas, Chances, and LifePaths, 
are more focusing on population of elderly, uh, while Chicos and Escape are more focusing on birth cohorts, basically, so children population. Uh, Eurolinkat is more focusing on congenital anomalies. And Escape is an interesting cohort in the sense that it's focusing on children, but mainly um, in the sense of exposure to air pollutants. So that's a quite specialized integrated cohort. And um, in the next minutes of my talks, I would like to um, give you some more details on some of those cohorts, not on all of them, but on some of them, and to explain how they've been built and which type of lessons we can learn from all those integrated cohorts. In general, before coming here, we have done a, a little inquiry um, towards those eight projects, trying to understand better what was the, the main challenges that, what were the main challenges that they encountered in building, uh, in building those cohorts of cohorts. And those challenges, as you can imagine, were very varied. And one of the first one um, was actually the, the definition and the validation of some variables. Of course, when we speak about omics, that's quite, um, I don't say easy, but that's, uh, that's quite straightforward in the sense that those are very factual data. When we start to speak about wealth or uh, income or diet, this is, of course, much more complicated, especially if you deal with different cultural um, backgrounds, which is available in Europe. So this, is, um, this was one of the challenges that was encountered by many of those um, builders of integrated cohorts. A second one was, of course, the um, uh, building uh, harmonization protocols that took uh, quite a lot of time for most of them. And the third one was the access to data. This is not always easy. Uh, we face a lot of different types of regulation, and sometimes also in terms of some specific populations, like in rare diseases, some countries, for example, do not agree uh, to share uh, sets of data with less than five patients, for example, because otherwise you can too easily get back to the original data. So um, that was not always obvious for all the different uh, cohorts. And uh, the last difficulty that I would like to mention, which is more, I have to say, addressed to the funders, is about precisely the funding, and in particular the funding at long term. I think we have discussed this yesterday quite extensively. Um, but this is a, a quite of an issue, in, at least for us, for example, who are building on a financial framework of five to seven years. And so this is really causing some, some problems in terms, for example, of measurements of long-term outcomes. And we don't have a lot of luxury for procrastination, although I fully agree about the added value that it can have. And that's something very important. And this, I think, is something that we have to really address in the future. Um, now, let me come to my first example of an integrated cohort, and the first example I would like to uh, explain a bit more in detail is the cohort called Chicos. And this is about building um, a child um, integrated cohort. Um, they took basically 76 uh, cohorts to do that, and this is gathering um, about half a million of children. And from 20, 21 European countries, and the coordinator of this study is the Barcelona Institute of Global Health. <laughs> so um, this is the map that showcases all the, uh, the different cohorts that have been integrated into this single study. And all those cohorts are available um, at an inventory which is mentioned there, um, listing all the birth cohorts that have been uh, included. And actually, this was quite a, a long-term effort that I started um, uh, close to 10 years ago in terms of the construction of the inventory of the birth cohorts, in terms of building the case studies to be, to be analyzed, in terms of reviewing the, all the data that were available. And this effort now is still prolongated in a new project, which is called Life Cycle, where they are testing new, new case studies. And um, precisely in terms of, of case studies, they've uh, first focused, uh, focused on, I think, more or less 10 of, of those. And for each of those case studies, they have included part of those cohorts um, that was quite variable between 10 or 30 or, uh, or 40 cohorts. And de of course, depending on that, uh, some different type of, of patients. And they have addressed um, very different type of working hypotheses, uh, ranging from fish consumption uh, for fetal growth to air pollution and birth weight. So it was quite a different type of science addressed. 
And for example, um, building on close to 150,000 infants from 30, 31 birth cohorts, they have been able to show that um, the preterm birth and infant weight gain is tightly associated with uh, childhood asthma risk. And there have been a lot of other uh, studies and case studies analyzed by this, um, by this integrated cohorts. Um, quite interesting to see uh, those publications. And in particular, what they have also delivered is a strategic document that really highlights the need to have this birth cohort established in Europe. And in this strategic document, they also explain the difficulties they have encountered. They're really pledging for having this cohort of cohorts um, uh, at the European level. And they explain, of course, also in detail all the protocols they have followed for the harmonization of data. Um, let's move to another example, and we move also from children to um, the aged population. So it's uh, uh, an integrated cohort that was called Chances. And this, um, this project was about um, deciphering what were the, the risk factors for aged people in Europe. This is based on 15 cohort studies um, with a close to a million um, people in Europe. This was coordinated by the Hellenic Health Foundation in Greece. And um, it was mainly European countries, but they also had um, three non-European cohorts, including one or two cohorts from the United States. And so in total, they have analyzed two, uh, close to 300 variables, and they have focused their case studies and working hypotheses uh, mainly in the area of cancer, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, osteoporosis and fractures, and cognitive function and psychiatric disorders. And I just would like to exemplify the fact that um, they have, of course, built their harmonization protocols, which are available um, as wiki pages. And those wiki pages, if I remember, are available on the websites of the Institute for Health and Welfare of Finland. And um, I mean, of course, it, it was not easy for them to have those harmonizations, as I mentioned before, and especially, um, as I also mentioned before, in terms of some specific variables like diet, for example, or for complex exposures. And um, well, nevertheless, they've been able to, um, to test several of those working hypotheses they formulated. I just showcased here two of them. Um, this one was published in the BMJ, uh, I think two years ago. And it was about the association of the low level of vitamin D with the risk to develop earlier um, some, uh, some diseases in uh, old population. And uh, another paper they have published um, is here, and that's about the healthy diet guidelines that was recommended by the WHO. You may know about that. And uh, they've been able to showcase that um, in all population, well, populations of elderly people, um, if they follow this, um, this uh, WHO healthy guidelines, um, they have a chance to, to gain two years of longevity compared to populations that do not follow those guidelines. So that was for the integrated cohort chances. Now we move to another project still focusing on the, uh, the elderly population. That's an ongoing project. It's called ATLAS. And it's about identifying patterns of healthy aging trajectories. And also in particular, what are the critical point in time where those healthy patterns can be affected and lead to some diseases. This is coordinated by the Parc Sanitari San Juan de Deu in Spain. And this is uh, cohorts from uh, about 40 European countries. Now, uh, ATLAS follows um, a quite specific harmonization protocols, which is according to the Malmström Research Guidelines. And um, Malmström Research um, is producing actually guidelines in terms of harmonization protocols, in terms of data gathering. And so all those harmonization algorithms will be made, of course, public and available to, um, to everybody. Again, not always easy to, um, to build those uh, harmonization protocols, and in particular, as I mentioned before, one of the, of the greatest difficulty for this project is about uh, when it comes to the values of education, income, wealth, and there um, they really think that it would be good to have uh, more standard definitions agreed uh, at a more global level. Um, I just would like to pinpoint the value of ATLAS in the sense that they also contribute to development of a catalog 
of epidemiological research networks that will be included within the, the global Maelstrom catalog. That's quite interesting in the sense that it gives access, of course, to all those research networks, but also identify all the information studies, um, identify uh, search for variables which are collected within those studies. And, um, and this seems to be quite promising, at least in, um, in this regard. And this is also a fully free access um, software. Um, next example, and that's the last one in terms of the age population. And this last example is the cohort called the LifePath. And LifePath is about analyzing the effect and the importance of uh, social differences in healthy aging. So they are gathering uh, 17 cohorts in total with a quite high number of, uh, of subjects, um, close to 2 million people. And this is coordinated by the Imperial College in London. And um, so as I mentioned, what is the purpose of LifePath, the main purpose of LifePath, is to see what is the influence of the socioeconomic status on the healthy status of age population. And they analyze that by different means. They even analyze that um, in case of economic recession condition. And um, again, it's an ongoing project, um, quite interesting. And um, this is the different cohorts which have been gathered into this project. And one of the issues also that they have um, in terms of difficulties and concerts is, for example, also merging the, the more biological science with the more social science. That's not always easy. To, um, to deal between soft and hard sciences, but at least um, they've been quite successful um, in the first years of their projects. And one of their first publication um, has been um, put in the Lancet last year. And you may know that the WHO has launched this plan of the 25 cross 25, that was meaning to decrease by 25% the burden of chronic disease by 2025. But in this plan, they were only uh, encountering the risk factors linked to the major diseases. They were not encountering the risk factors that could be linked to socioeconomic status. And this is precisely what LifePath has been doing. And they've been able to show that in terms of all population, the first health risk is of course smoking. The second one is physical inactivity, but the third one is the socioeconomic status and the low socioeconomic status in particular, of course. So I know that from um, people in this room who are belonging to LifePad that they are still producing quite a lot of interesting paper. One that, um, if I well understood yesterday, has been published uh, very recently. And um, so we, we, have, we have quite a lot of hope on this project. The final example I would like to mention, and now we are back to more um, child population cohorts, is about the, um, um, an integrated cohort um, on children suffering from congenital anomalies. This is coordinated by the Queen Mary University of London and gathers 22 cohorts and studies. And uh, yeah, this is the map of the different cohorts that have been um, taken into this, um, this project. And the reason I, I mentioned this, this starting project is that, of course, not only they, um, they gather all those data about um, congenital anomalies, but in addition, what they also do is to develop kind of a reciprocal relationship between the patients and the family of the patients and the health care. And we do think that this is something quite important. And uh, I know that Jeremy mentioned yesterday that we need to explain also to the people and to the population why a cohort can be useful. And we do think here that this is a quite exemplative uh, case where at least a cohort can also not only serve for scientific purpose, but also serve in terms of communication and explaining how science can be useful and how cohorts can be useful to the population. So that's why I, I just mentioned that. And in addition, I mean, they also try to, of course, to link all their data sets to the governmental mortality statistics, to the hospital statistics, and to the prescription databases. So this is a, a landscape of some projects which are ongoing about building cohorts of cohorts at the EU level. And some, um, what are the next steps for us as a funder when, when we see all those projects? And our next steps um, actually is um, um, compiled in a topic that we have published last year. 
and with a deadline uh, in three weeks, um, a deadline fixed on 18th of April. This is not a topic for research per se, this is more a topic for the coordination. And what we want to do here is that um, we, we just try to encourage to have all those cohorts getting together, first to, to build a map of the landscape that we have available in terms of cohorts in Europe or at the international level, to identify the best strategies on how to build uh, cohort integration, so the best strategies on how to build cohorts of cohorts. Um, also to promote the harmonization of data on how to agree on standardization on some specific uh, variables which are available in those cohorts, uh, how to foster the inclusion of new type of data, how to foster in the inclusion of new cohorts into those integrated cohorts, and of course how to um, best uh, practice and optimize access uh, to, um, to data. And of course, we want to put that also in a certain international context. And I think this topic is quite well fitting with the purpose of this meeting. And this is the reason why we, we are very happy to, um, uh, to support and to encourage this, this effort, which is done at the global level. And so uh, we look forward about what will be developed both in this topic and as a result of this meeting. Thanks a lot. a directly relevant question. When I look at those research priorities, there's something about environmental health, but you've, you've still got 25% of all the cancer deaths in the EU are due to smoking, that the fraction of deaths due to smoking is still rising steeply in women. And it, you know, things like smoking and alcohol just don't explicitly come up because they're not fashionable anymore. And I, I think that that's, that's a mistake. I think one should take the few things like smoking, what one can do to you know, reduce the amount that drinkers drink at least, um, to avoid the question as to whether there's any protective effect of some drinking versus none, which there probably isn't. And also, why is it that people aren't taking pills that would really reduce their risk of death? I mean, medication is a major determinant of the changing mortality, and the what are the determinants of whether the, the cheap generic medicines that work actually get taken and that, that, you know, when I see these vistas of priorities, they don't seem to, you know, like half of all deaths in Europe would be related to one or other of those things. And they don't come up as much as, you know, environmental as that and the other thing does, which, you know, I don't want to be rude about the environment, but, you know, I'm a tobacco addict. <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm, okay, I can perfectly take this point. I think it's also part of the... Um, um, once we are publishing those calls for proposal, I think that we are expecting precisely those points to be addressed in the, in the proposal to be submitted to us. And um, I mean, our priorities are quite large and, um, uh, and basically quite open to any type of potential research that may be supported. So I, I think we are quite open in the sense that uh, we are not too prescriptive in those priorities. So hopefully what, what you mentioned can, can find its way. Could you comment on uh, privacy regulations and where they're headed in the uh, EU and what impact they may have on this, uh, this effort? Yes, that's um, the very important question. And um, as we know, in those current days, um, we face, um, to, to make a long story short, we are facing 28 different types of regulations in terms of data protection. And the idea with the new general data protection regulation that will be coming into force in May, uh, we will have only one specific regulation at the whole EU level. So this is a major step forward. Now, as you may have seen, this, um, this new GDPR, as we call it, is quite severe in terms of data protection. We do think that this is something which is needed, um, and we have seen that the recent actuality um, explains why it could be needed. But, of course, we, we have made sure to have exception for research. 
so basically, uh, research, scientific research, and the circulation of data, and especially the, the non-disappearance of the data uh, for scientific research is protected under this regulation. It doesn't mean that things are always clear. As you know, we have now um, what is called a working party on the Article 29 of this regulation that is precisely discussing some, um, some specific chapters, like the consent, for example. And because this is one of the, of the most dedicated things in this GDPR, we have some exception um, about the level of granularity for the consent and how consent can be reused and not to redo consent when you reuse data for other purposes. But uh, for this, we expect to have more specific guidelines published as soon as possible. Thank you for um, highlighting <coughs> um, your successes in bringing these cohorts together. You mentioned at the outset there were a number of challenges in harmonization and data access and so on. But could you um, help us uh, understand what the lessons learned if uh, you have from assembling these cohorts? What, what can we take forward and, and uh, not necessarily repeat things that didn't work out so well? I think it's a, maybe a bit early to see what should, should not be repeated uh, at this level. And we expect a lot of this present to the last topic that I've shown to you. We expect scientists in this proposal that will be submitted to us to explain exactly what uh, should be the lessons learned and how to build more efficient cohorts of cohorts. So what, um, what we see is that the, the question we have is that how to be best efficient in building those cohorts. Do we have to go from building very consolidated integration of cohorts or do we have rather to go for collaboration between cohorts and if yes, at, how, at which level? I think those are the main questions that we are expecting. For the time being, I think that's based on the, the certain low number of, of people we have in those cohorts. We would continue to push to build cohorts of cohorts, but we expect within this specific action that we have launched and with a deadline in three weeks, uh, that scientists can explain also and recommend to us what would be the things to do and not to do. I think the ball is mainly in their camp because they are the owner of those cohorts and they are the, the people leading those cohorts and they know better than anybody else what, what is realistic to be done and what is not realistic to be done. At a further perspective, as a, as a policy maker, what we see is that we just want to have the risk factor being assessed with more details and with more value. And that's the reason why we build those integrated cohorts. Now the way to do it and the best way to implement it, this we expect from the scientists to do. Philip, can I just ask on that? Because asking a group of scientists who are leading that investigation, who are also hoping for continued funding, is always a challenge to find the, ch the, the difficulties they faced in setting up the cohorts. So what governance structure does the EU put around these to ensure that, that there is a, um, at least a sort of emotional sense that they're going to be continued, that, yeah, the challenges will be faced both by the funder and by the investigators, and that it isn't a case of just presenting great information in order to get the next round of grants? Yes, that's a very important question, and to be frank with you, we have some of those projects uh, whose databases are not sustained anymore. So this is a major issue. In terms of governance, I mean, the only thing or the main thing that we have to encourage them is to secure, of course, additional funding, not to count only on our supports for building those cohorts, because we are tied with um, a mandate from the legislator to be obliged every, I mean, you know, every five or seven years to reopen call for proposals which are competitive. We can just not decide that this cohort as a named beneficiary will benefit from X amount of euro. And this is quite of a problem. So in terms of governance, we try to always ask to people that they need to build um, sustainability plans for the future. And based on that, I mean, the, the best way we can encourage them is to secure additional funding resources in addition to what we do. And that's not always easy because, of course, to maintain cohort is costing a lot of money as well. I think it would be great to come back to this at some point, uh, because obviously cycles of funding, which are usually coming three to five years, are not conducive to running long-term cohorts. 
Uh, it's particularly if every three to five years they're going to be opened up for competition that allows any or everybody else to then apply. That's a good point. Uh, I think yep. ultimately this is at the heart of whether these cohorts work or not. Yep. Um, cohort to cohort, say the, um, the life path or the athlotes. Can you just describe the process for, let's say, an outside researcher to propose a, a study and have it reviewed and then how the data is analyzed, you know, whether they actually get the data set or you have a team of analysts to do their, do their analyses? The way of selecting the projects is based on competitive calls for proposal and on peer review. So basically, I mean, as for any funding agency in the world, um, people submit their proposal, they are peer reviewed by independent experts, and the um, best proposal selected can be funded by us. So that's, at that level, it's quite, quite clear and following the usual paths, basically. So the researcher then gets the raw data? Sorry? Does the researcher get a raw data set that they analyze themselves, or you have a team that does the analysis? You mean, I mean the, the, the project itself is doing all the analysis. We don't do anything special on, on our side. Okay, so you give them a rod. Yes, absolutely. It's a mandate we give to them. We give the funding, they give us the results, basically. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I've been part of some of these cohorts of cohorts myself, and I've enjoyed it a lot, but they have some major challenges that I don't think the cohorts themselves can solve. And one is that, at least in those that I've been part of, the Nordic countries with huge birth cohorts <coughs> have been the major source of data. And then the other additional cohorts, some of them have had a lot of resources, but for most, they've been very small and had very little resources and, and very much uncertainty about their futures. And they don't in any way represent European populations. And there's no mechanism for getting data from all those other countries and parts of the populations. And on the contrary, in, in a way, by supporting these, not that I'm against it, but it, it's just inherently very hard to get more cohorts from the right places in Europe in order to get information and knowledge about health in other countries and other population groups. So it's in a way strengthening the uh, inequalities in, in resources to research to build those cohorts of cohorts. Interesting points. I think we are back to this issue of um, building very long-term and prospective cohorts in Europe and with um, a long-term perspective. And we are back to this um, debate on, on funding agencies and how to do it best and on the longer term. But I, I understand the point that you make. Yeah. All right. Uh, the West, uh, the so many of the cohorts that you describe are um, custom built uh, for children, for aging, and, and many of the cohorts that we that are represented in this room are, are built totally disease and focus agnostic. It, 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 we think an advantage of that second approach is that you can look at disease relationships across the spectrum of age, across yep. the spectrum of, of disease silos. So in, in your funding decisions, or, or ha has there been a, a thought around generating cohorts that are more population-based as opposed to uh, custom built or custom built for, for, for particular yes absolutely that's um, that's um, a debate that we have and again we are we are quite ho uh, open but um, indeed we would be really favoring to build now more disease neutral cohorts especially if you want to assess more the comorbidities for example uh, and risk factors um, of comorbidities on population yeah that's a very good point Yes. So thank you very much. And thank you. I want to introduce to you um, uh, Dean Mary Klotman. Uh, uh, Mary is, um, is a clinician scientist uh, who studies uh, HIV pathogenesis um, 
We were extremely lucky to get her to come to Duke about uh, eight or nine years ago from Mount Sinai to uh, chair the Department of Medicine. And about a year ago, she assumed the helm of the School of Medicine as dean. Uh, among her platforms and strategies, which are relevant to what this group is talking about, are data science, uh, precision medicine, and population health science. Um, Mary could not be here yesterday to, to welcome us, but today we're, we're grateful that she could spend the time this morning. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to alter my bio a little bit. I returned to Duke. I, I'm actually a very proud, what we call quadruple Dukey, which means I did many, many of my years in training here. But anyway, um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here. This is an amazing event, and the power of the cohorts in this room is really palpable. Um, I'd like to recognize Francis, although apparently Francis has stepped out of the room, but certainly recognize his leadership and Jer Jeremy Farr, certainly for his leadership of the Welcome Trust. And Jeff, Jeff is really our um, sort of heart and soul of precision medicine at Duke and has really gotten the faculty organized with some very exciting initiatives and recognize him as the founding president of the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative. So thank you, Jeff. Um, this is a historic moment, uh, and it's one feat just to get you all in the room, but I would challenge you that the bigger feat is ahead of you, which is really to figure out how you can take the power of all these cohorts and really start melding them in a way that they are exponentially more powerful. And I think we're all focused on, on the mechanics of how you do that. I know even internal to a single institution, we are focused on the mechanics of how we leverage our cohorts um, internally. So thinking about how you do it uh, globally is at, at one level daunting, but, but certainly we all have the same sort of aspirational goal. A couple of uh, things that we've been doing at Duke, certainly uh, we've been trying to gear up for this revolution in, in data science, um, gearing up in terms of, of really building our workforce, and it's really exciting to be dean of a university that is not just a school of medicine, but has uh, you know, a reach to our engineering school and our basic science, our ba basic math, because that gives us an opportunity to build out a quantitative science base that, that is really exciting. And so uh, along with the provost, Sally Kornbluth, we've had a major initiative here that called the Quantitative Initiative to start building our base of, of quantitative scientists. And then many of you might know um, Rob Califf. I don't know if Rob is here, uh, but we were very lucky to recruit Rob back um, from the FDA, uh, although they weren't so lucky to lose him, um, to lead a cross-campus initiative that in a smaller sense, I think it, it reflects the goal of this very big initiative here, which is really starting to bring teams of quantitative scientists and biomedical scientists and clinical investigators together to start really addressing some very, very big questions. Some of them are quite practical to our own health system, because um, I always like to make the case that the, the real advantage of an academic health system is to tap into that, that very deep uh, base of scientists that we have at Duke. Um, and some of them are much more pertinent to some of our, our, our national challenges in delivering health care. And then some of them are going to be really working with our basic scientists, because they are generating data at a pace that they cannot keep up with today. Um, we also have a, a couple of other exciting initiatives uh, across campus in terms of really organizing our, our health data that we collect every day. Um, we, d we built a new department of population health science with Les Leslie Curtis um, leading that, really to again build a base of scientists that can start, start leveraging these databases to really inform um, both our clinical mission as well as our, our science mission. So we are, in a small way, reflecting some of the challenges that you're taking on in a global sense, which is really leveraging the power of these data sets and these cohorts that I know take so much effort um, and on-the-ground mechanics to put together. But I think you do it because you believe that, that that this will provide a resource that will really pay off in, in many, many ways if we figure out how to, to put this all together. So thank you all for coming here today. Uh, I heard yesterday was an amazing day. I wish I could sit through the whole day, but it's not my job these days. Um, I, I haven't fig figured out my job, frankly. Um, I think it's putting out fires. But uh, anyway, enjoy it. And again, thank you for coming. <laughs>